Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up on the show, my guest today is an award-winning author whose fiction takes in everything from the clash of cultures to class, caste and teenage crushes. Abba Dawasa moved from her native Delhi to the US as a student. Now she's in Paris for the Festival America. She's here to tell us more. Abba, thanks so much for joining us on France 5. You're in Paris for the Festival America, which celebrates the plurality of English language literature from the Americas generally. And your latest book, Madison Square Park, does take place in the US, but there's something of a clash of cultures. Can you tell us more? Yeah, there's a clash of cultures um, and there's a lot about the past in the book. The main character is um, an American um, who is of Indian origin and is living... Um, sort of a double life because she's living with a man and her parents who live around the corner from her in New Jersey do not know about it. And um, so that's how the novel begins. And then very, very quickly we find out that she's pregnant. And from that point on, um, there's some very difficult choices she has to make because she can't continue um, having this, this double life. Um, so we see a lot um, of her past, um, her clash with her parents, uh, which is in part a cultural clash, but also a generational clash. And it's not very clear all of the time where sort of one clash begins um, and the other one, um, one, one ends and the other begins. So um, there's a lot of ambiguity in the novel as well. You mentioned the weight of the protagonist's family now. There are a lot of family secrets, family history in this book. It's an important part of the story. Do you think we can really liberate ourselves from our family or are we, is it fatal? Can we not really escape our backgrounds? Um, I think it's, 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 I very much wrote that novel um, to explore that very question. And I think at moments it seems like she's able to and at moments she's really not able to. Um, and then... Um, uh, there's also, uh, so there's the cultural weight of the family and the particular memories that you have with your family. And in her case, a lot of these memories happen to be in India. Um, so we see a lot of flashbacks. And then there's the final weight, which is also a genetic weight that you carry, uh, a genetic past from your family, um, which isn't quite what it seems at first blush. Uh, when I speak about it, if you read the book, there's a, there's a secret there as well. Um, um, I think it's possible, um, and I think that there's definitely hope in the novel of that. Um, and the hope is partly in terms of the future, uh, and partly uh, coming from uh, the, the possibility of love. Um, she loves somebody who isn't of that culture and isn't of that, of that background and who, um, it, it, you know, holds a promise uh, for something different. And you yourself, you've experienced various cultures living in India and the US and you spent time here in Paris as well. What does the city mean for you as a writer? Uh, Paris uh, symbolizes and means uh, a tremendous amount of freedom and beauty as a writer to me. Um, I've, I've written parts of all my novels, I think, or many of my novels here. And uh, being surrounded by the French language at a time when you're writing with English just gives you a different perspective into, into the English language. Uh, there's also, I think, languages and cultures allow you to be and inhabit a different part of who you are. And I think I'm a different person in, in the French language than I am in Hindi or I'm in English. Um, and I like that part of me. Um, it's, it's different and, uh, and I love the city. So uh, I've, it's, it's always been inspiring and I think will continue to be. Well, you're not the only writer who's been inspired yes, by know. Paris. <laughs> we're, we're moving to a Parisian institution now, a reference for bibliophiles, Shakespeare & Co. The Left Bank Bookshop's been open for almost 100 years. Now it's celebrating its rich literary history with a new book, A History of the Rag and Bone Shop of the Heart. From Anais Nin to Ian Rankin, the shop's welcomed thousands of writers over the years. Nicola Hebden tells us more. This legendary bookstore is known the world over, welcoming tourists, students and writers looking for a slice of bohemian life in Paris. If its walls could talk, they'd tell as many stories as the books contained within them. Shakespeare and Company originated in 1919 at the time located in the Latin Quarter. The store played host to Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, among other big authors. James Joyce's Ulysses was also first published here. Today's incarnation on the banks of the Seine was opened in 1951 by George Whitman. His daughter Sylvia is keeping the shop's legacy alive. The bookshop is like a theatre and the characters change, you know, 
uh, every now and then and the, the theatre stays the same, the same set. For the first time, the store's rich history is put down on paper in a new book called A History of the Rag and Bone Shop of the Heart. The poet called Ted Jones, he was here when Anais Nin gave her reading in the 70s. And um, he talks about how the queue going out all the way to Notre Dame and how George came down with, with old tuna tins and tried to serve everyone wine. And Anais Nin was shocked by this and instead she grabbed the bottle. And... Since the beginning, writers have been invited to live in the store, given the affectionate nickname Tumbleweeds. Welcoming authors is at the heart of the shop's philosophy. This is one of the mottos of the bookshop above the doorway. Be not inhospitable to strangers, lest they be angels in disguise. My name is Emmy Dowling. I'm Australian and I'm a tumbleweed at Shakespeare and Company. I'm Mari Rostik. I'm an Estonian and I'm a tumbleweed at Shakespeare and Company. The stories and the connections that people have with this shop that's, I think, the best part of uh, Shakespeare and Co's history. Uh, so this is where I slept last night, or the last couple of nights. My bed. And around the corner, over there, there's a bed also. Yes. Next to piano bed. I've been sleeping there also. With celebrated international writers like Zadie Smith and Ethan Hawke giving readings, and a writer's retreat on the horizon, Shakespeare and Co is set to remain a wonderland of books. But did you make it to Shakespeare and Co when you were here in Paris? Yeah, I did. And when my book, uh, That Summer in Paris, came out, um, I actually had a, a reading at Shakespeare and Co. Um, and I have very fond memories of it. And it was important to me because I'd written that book. Um, it's really about writing and about being inspired by Paris. And to be able to present it at a place like Shakespeare was just absolutely priceless. Yeah, it's the perfect place. Now, speaking of all things literary, I wanted to come back to an earlier novel of yours, Baby G. Uh, the protagonist of the novel, Anamika, is interested in literature. She even name checks Nabokov, but she's also passionate about physics. We don't normally th see these two things together. Do you think writers have something to learn from physicians and physicians from writers? Um, I think writers have something to learn uh, from all of the sciences and the arts because writing is, is sort of limitless and it has no boundaries. Um, and she's also an adolescent, so she's growing up and she's trying to find where her real passions lie. Uh, she's inspired by literature, but she also sees a lot of freedom in um, the sort of quantum physics pieces that she's learning in, in school at that time. Um, and she's just sort of absorbing the entire world as one is wont to do when, is, when one is that young in quite a, an existential way at times, mm -hmm. I noticed. Now, in this book, there's a focus on the female condition about how women are seen in society and how they feel as well. There's a scene in the novel when a female character suffers sexual harassment in public transport. Now, this book was written in 2005, um, long before this kind of sexual violence, perhaps, came to international attention, specifically regarding Delhi, uh, the city yeah. in India. Do you think the situation's improving? You know, it's very hard to say. I think that what has what has changed is that I think um, uh, young women are less and less passive about it, um, and they they realise that they must a uh, come out in large numbers to protest it, but also band together and be more vocal. Um, the, during the time this novel is set and when this happens, I think uh, there was a tendency to just sort of feel a lot of shame and, and remain quiet about it. But it was also a time when I think the level of violence was less. Uh, it's, there seem, the incidents seem to get more violent now than before, and also the population has increased. There's a lot of things simultaneously happening um, that I think uh, make it worse, but there's, there's a moment when things get worse before there's transformation, and that's at least what I hope. OK. Now, the novel also touches on some very serious social questions, the class struggle and the notion of different castes in Indian society, and the notion of quotas, now that, which is often referred to in the US as affirmative action. What's your opinion regarding that in India? I think it depends on what that system of quota is uh, and to what extent it is applied. Uh, there's always been a, a, a quota system uh, of, of a certain kind for caste, and, and I think uh, it's, it's necessary. Uh, but beyond that, there are various sort of tweaks and changes to it that 
this particular book deals with that happened in the late 90s, 80s and early 90s um, that led to a tremendous amount of student agitation and violence um, that took it in a different direction. And caste is a constantly transforming thing. It's not something that has that is the same as what it was 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. Um, so now it's as much a political identity as it is a social identity uh, now in modern India today. So uh, it's something that redefines itself and reinvents itself and will eventually um, find a, 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 a different place. It allows various groups to give voice to themselves uh, for better or for worse. Because at the end of the day, if you really want to just sort of, one can be idealistic and want to transcend everything and have none of these identities, but the truth is what we're going to end up with are multiple identities rather than just an identity as a human being. I mean, that just sort of doesn't exist. We live in a context. Well, it's certainly a fascinating insight into the society itself. Now, we're finishing with one of your cultural tips, something very, very different here, a performance that mixes percussion, dance, and comedy. The stage show Stomp has been going for 25 years. <laughs> about what is it that you like so much about it? You know, um, I kind of, ever since I've lived in New York for 20 years, I've seen that, uh, that poster. And one day I finally said, you know, I know it's all tourists are going in there, let me go in. And it just sort of, because it's all sound and nothing else, and it's pure sound, um, you, you get, your, your brain kind of gets shaken up by it. And the whole time I was there, I actually have a tip for the producers of Stomp, uh, which I've been wanting to give for a long time, so I'm glad I have the forum for it. I'd love to see them make music with typewriters okay. and keyboards, because uh, literally like a typing keyboard, because they make music with every kind of object out there. And it is music, it's not noise, and it's fascinating. Um, as to you know what the difference between those two things are and the number of objects and instruments and movements and sounds that you can use to create music. And the only thing that I found missing was sort of the clack, clack, clack of the keyboard. Well, there's a great <laughs> tip for the producers then. Uh, Abba Dawa thank you so much for joining us today. We'll leave you with a clip of that show. Remember to check out our website. You can also follow Encore on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this.